want to say uh, happy Pentecost to you all. It's not Pentecost, I'm just kidding. But there's so much, some of you guys, you, you knew what I was going to say. Uh, I know, game day, I guess, you know, it's just another way to put it. This, you'll notice the scripture is not uh, on the slides this morning because it is rather lengthy. And I didn't know if you saw the slides, if you would start crying. So I did not put them up this morning. You will just have to listen to the story. It's one that you've heard before, perhaps, maybe not. Maybe when you were younger, maybe at BBS. Who knows where you encountered the story? Maybe in the VeggieTales cartoons, I don't know. But this morning, we are going to share the story of King Nebuchadnezzar and the fiery furnace. So hear these words from Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits, whose width was 6 cubits. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. The king, then King Nebuchadnezzar sent for the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to assemble and come to the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. When they were standing before the statue that he had set up, the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the old statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound, all peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Accordingly, at this time, certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble shall fall down and worship the golden statue. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These pay you no heed, O king. They do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the golden statue you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods? You do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the entire musical ensemble, fall down, worship the statue I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times more than was customary and ordered some of the strongest guards in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to throw them in the furnace of the blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, their trousers, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the furnace. Because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the three men fell down, bound into the furnace of blazing fire. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. He rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, Was it not three men that we threw into the fire? They answered the king, True. True, O king. He replied, But I see four men unbound walking in the middle of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the fourth has an appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So they came out from the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their tunics were not harmed. And not even the smell of fire came from them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that utters blasphemy against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. The king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. That wasn't so bad. survived the story. Some of you were on the edge of your seats. It's not game day yet, friends. The game hasn't started. Why so nervous? Wondering what was going to happen to these three men. In 2013, the Reverend Dr. William Barber II went down to the legislative house in North Carolina. Now, he had a handful of people with him, and they began a protest, uh, a protest called Moral Mondays. They were using their right as U.S. citizens to nonviolently protest the work of the government there that had focused on, according to, to Barber himself in his book, The Third Reconstruction, what the legisl legislature was about. Defunding the government through a flat tax that increased the burden on poor people while giving the wealthiest the windfall. The denial of federally funded health care to half a million North Carolinians. The rejection of federal unemployment benefits for 170,000 individuals and their families. Cuts to public education that increased teachers' workloads while decreased overall compensation. Deregulation of industries that have demonstrated a record of environmental abuse. A constitutional amendment to deny equal protection to LGBTQ citizens and the worst voter suppression bill America has seen in over a half century. Now I want to pause here for a moment before we go any further. Because I'm guessing, just guessing, that there might be more than a few people in this room who are nervous that this sermon is meddling in politics. And I thought long and hard before introducing Dr. Barber as a potential modern-day saint. It's one of the reasons I selected the Daniel text this morning. There are other reasons, but you'll hear them in a moment. There are some who might label Barber's work as partisan, a part of some particular political agenda. But I will have you know, Dr. William Barber, who is a Disciples of Christ pastor in North Carolina, takes the Bible seriously on one hand and stands in opposition to policies that, that he sees as hurtful to the poor and the disenfranchised. He takes his faith seriously and he believes that his faith calls him to act, to speak, to move, to demonstrate, Is this preacher trying to espouse a particular political agenda? As I've looked at his work, as I've read uh, some of his book, I, I don't think so. But I could see 
how others might think he is. I recognize that the way in which Dr. Barber practices his, his faith does have consequences in the public sphere, even in the political arena. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were brought before the most powerful political figure of their day, the king. Just like Jesus, who spoke to the religiously powerful and eventually found himself on a Roman cross. Just like Paul, who preached the message and the gospel and the way he felt called to do and found himself in prison on more than one occasion. Just like Martin Luther King Jr. Just like William Barber and countless others who have decided to act and speak out to those in power to say something about what they see because they feel their faith, their faith is pulling them, urging them, calling them to do so. And for that, they have found themselves in prison on more than one occasion. But I want to be clear this morning. I'm not promoting a certain political agenda or perspective. I've been in this pulpit for over 10 years. Hopefully you know me all well enough by now that that is not how I preach. But I do preach from scripture. I do my best to share the gospel, the good news. I try my best to give a historical context of what was happening in the ancient world and the injustices we see there, and to note the injustices that are happening in our own context. And believe me, friends, I think you would agree that there are some, and that we, as a people of faith, are called to move, to act, to, to preach, to demonstrate, to say, that when we see those injustices, that we won't stand for it. It's people of faith. For Barber's efforts, he was arrested, that first demonstration, along with a dozen or so colleagues who had joined him. And he decided to go back down to the legislature the following Monday. This time, there were hundreds that joined him. Soon word began to spread that a movement of the people was taking place there in North Carolina. There was a preacher who had a heart for the poor, could not stand by and watch people with power abuse it and abuse the very people they were sworn to protect. Now, he states in his book that he didn't start out to create a movement. He wrote that he just felt compelled to go and speak up for the poor and the hurting to make sure those who were making laws that directly impacted his neighbors knew the impact and damage they were doing. Since that first protest, he has since resurrected Dr. King's Poor People's Campaign, a nationwide movement to help the government become aware of the damage that has been done to the most vulnerable in our community. Thousands of people across the U.S. and even here in Kansas City had joined that effort to secure health and safety for the most vulnerable in our communities. And they do so. They do so because they feel the call of their faith pulling them to act, to respond. I was in church in Indianapolis, 2017. I was attending the General Assembly of the Disciples of Christ, and that's why I was first introduced to Dr. William Barber. I was in that church where he gave his sermon, and wouldn't you know it, he picked Daniel 3 as his text. For almost an hour, I was wrapped up in the faith and life that he brought forth from that text. Don't worry, I'm not preaching an hour. I'm just saying he did. The challenge he issued from the crowd that morning, he didn't just preach a sermon, he sang life into that room. And I mean literally sang, because at the end of his sermon, he just started to sing this, this song that filled us with such courage, such emotion, such spirituality to call us out of our complacency, to ask us to join the work of the Poor People's Campaign, to step out in faith, join together in the pursuit of justice, to 
take our faith and move from just belief into action, response, love. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were face to face with the king, the king. They had made their choice. Their faith told them not to bow down before false idols. To do so was to abandon God. They couldn't do it. They couldn't give in. So they did what they felt was right, knowing that there were consequences for their actions, knowing that there were repercussions. The powers that be, they brought them before the king. And they didn't see the need to stand there to try and justify their actions and explain why they refused to bow down to the statue that the king had built. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they make that incredible statement in verse 17 and 18. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. We won't do it. And it is precisely at this point in the story where I am most perplexed, most challenged, and most in awe of their faith, their will. It wasn't that these three had all the confidence in the world that everything was going to turn out all right. They know that people went into the furnace, didn't come out. They understood the danger. And they remained standing. And they were thrown into the fire. Dr. Barber was invited to speak on Bill Mayer's show. I don't know if you know who Bill Mayer is. He's a talk show host and one of the most uh, renowned atheists uh, in our culture. He is skeptical of faith. When Barber was introduced on his show, he turned to Mayer and said, you know, I'm an atheist which took Bill Mayer by surprise. He thought he was interviewing a pastor, this ordained uh, Disciples of Christ pastor who just said on national television that he didn't believe in God. But Barbara went on to say, I explained that if we were talking about the God who hates poor people, immigrants, and LGBTQ folks, I don't believe in that God either. Sometimes, he said, it helps to clarify our language. It's important to clarify our language. What God are we speaking of? What gospel are we following? This is one of the problems I see facing our community, our country. We can't even have a conversation anymore about our differences, whether they be religious or political, without people demonizing one another. We can't talk about social justice anymore without someone feeling like we're bringing politics into it. It's why I felt the need at the beginning of this very sermon to say what I did. How did we get here, friends? When did we allow taking care of our neighbor, protecting the widows and orphans or immigrants, or feeding the hungry become politicized? When did we give that up? This is the work of the church, friends. This is our work as people of faith. This is what we have been called to do. This is the message Dr. Barber and others like him have tried to remind the Christian community of. It's not just about what we believe. It is about what we do. It is not just about what we say. It is how we show up for our neighbor. Oh, and Jesus had something to say about that too. He is our neighbor, someone asked him once, and he just happened to say, everyone. If we can't talk about this without someone claiming we're promoting some political agenda, then we have lost our ability to say anything or to live out the gospel. I can't live my faith that way. And I wouldn't ask you to either. Wasn't it Jesus who said, I've come to release the captives, give sight to the blind, declare the year of the Lord's favor, 
Wasn't it Jesus who said, whenever you feed someone, close someone, house someone, you're doing it to me? Wasn't it Jesus who said, love your neighbor as yourself? Wasn't it Jesus who said, love your enemy? Friends, we should be about that work as well. I don't care what your politics are. I'm not talking politics this morning. Last week, Kevin shared some qualities of what makes a saint. He offered three. Courage, dependability, and sacrificial living. Dr. Barber has shown us two more. Faith and uncertainty. And on the surface, they seem like two opposite things, but I believe they go hand in hand for modern day saints such as yourselves. Faith is trust, trust in God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they trusted God. They knew their faith was to God alone and not to man-made idols, not to the rich and powerful, not to the one with the loudest voice, not to the one who demanded loyalty without earning it or without giving people a reason for it. They would not bow down to such idols or to such people, and we shouldn't either. God. They, God had earned their trust. Greater than wealth. Greater than power. Greater than blind loyalty. Trust in justice. Trust in caring for one another. Trust in the community. Trust in your neighbor. Trust in each other. Trust in God. And even despite our trust, and even though we have great and tremendous faith to take a stand, to move and to act, the future is still uncertain. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's story could have ended very differently. But their powerful witness and message would have been just as strong. Willing to stare that danger in the face when you know it's right, when you know what it is that you have been called to do. And in that moment, God showed up. And the story ends with an incredible witness of even the most powerful person in the land to see how God shows up. That is the same God who called Dr. Barber, a Disciples of Christ pastor in North Carolina, to be a voice for the voiceless and share a message of hope to those who have lost theirs. When he started his journey, he had no idea where it would lead. He didn't know it would land him in jail more than a few times, that it would take a toll on his health, that it would be a challenging journey, that there would be uncertain days, but there were. But despite that uncertainty, he put his faith into action and has become a witness of God's love and care for the world. Where will your faith, saints, lead you? You don't have to be a powerful preacher. You don't have to be an activist in the way that Dr. Barber is. I'm not sure where your faith will lead you, saints. All I can promise you is uncertainty. But I can also promise you that no matter where it leads, God will show up.